लेक्चर इलेवन Okay, so the last class was uh, quite crucial in several respects, and uh, I want to quickly go through some main uh, some main things that we did there. Okay, so so the way to picture that is that you have a you have a vector x and vector y, and you have some joint PDF by which these guys are related. Okay, so in our case, what what happens? Y equals x plus n. That's the ideal AWGN type assumption. But in general, you can view view it as some joint PDF. So joint PDF could be specified as say. So in many cases, this might be possible. Okay, maybe you can find all conditional PDFs for all possible y and x. Okay, so that's a way of specifying joint PDF. And assuming you also know the PDF for X itself, this completely defines the joint PDF. Okay, so the receiver, the transmitter has X, okay, and the receiver has Y. Okay, so from Y, you have to come up with a function, okay, which I called X hat, right? So X hat is what the re receiver produces, which claims is an estimate of X. Okay, but what is it exactly? It is some function of Y. Okay, so one can come up with kind of a joint PDF for X and X hat if you want, X Y and X hat if you want. All all of these things together will will have joint probability distributions. Okay, so what do I mean by that? A joint PDF for X and X hat. What do I mean by that? If you transmit X, the receiver is likely to decide X hat is one of several possibilities from the constellation, right? So X belongs to some constellation with some probability. Okay, so basically that's the probability that we are concerned about. Okay, which is the probability which you want to maximize? Probability that x hat equals x. That's so. So you want the joint PDF to lie on that straight line. If you plot the joint PDF of x and x hat, you want it to be close on close to that straight line. X equals x hat. That's why you want all the mass to be. Okay, so that's that's how you want to design your function of y. Okay, so that's a very abstract way of viewing the problem. Okay, so in most cases it will simplify to a very easy situation which is not uh, all that difficult to handle okay but this itself is called the detection problem in some cases yeah this is the detection problem okay it's a very very well studied problem and one can argue without without major contradictions that the whole of digital communications essentially is a solution to the detection problem okay so there's no you would not be wrong if somebody says that Okay, so that's that's a very valid argument. So detection theory is also vast in its so many ways. Okay, but the way we uh, came up with uh, a good detector, we we studied two detectors, right? Well, three. Okay, the first detector was what? The MAP detector, which was the optimal detector. Okay, what did the MAP detector do? You can succinctly write it down as x hat equals argument of maximum over x in the alphabet of what probability that x equals x given y equals y okay so this was my map rule okay so you see you don't have to worry too much about uh, the dis distribution of x hat and all that you can just use the joint pdf of x and y to define this guy okay so this was optimal in what sense which which is the objective function that it maximized or minimized what was the objective function that I looked at? Probability of correct decision, right? So, and that was maximized by this choice of x hat as the function. Okay, so rem remember, this will be a function of y. Okay, so this will be a function of y. That also you can see, depending on y, this x hat will change. Okay, so it's a random variable. All those things are clear. Okay, so now uh, there's another estimator, uh, another detector, which is the ML detector which can be written down as argument of maximization over x in x probability that y equals y given well in this case typically you don't write probability you write what you write some pdf because i'm expecting y to be continuous okay so i'll write y given x here okay so this is the way i wrote down 
and uh, this is another detector okay so irrespective of anything else i can choose to run this detector there's nothing wrong in that okay but usually when is this detector optimal not usually actually when is this detector optimal when all the different inputs are equally likely okay so the x if x the pdf of x is uniform then ml is also optimal in the sense that it maximizes my objective function which is probability of correct decision okay so that's the that's the thing so i derived it based on that so please see that the last thing i saw i called it something else i think the best thing to call that is the minimum distance minimum distance detector okay what did that work out to it's much simpler argument of maximum x in the alphabet remember my alphabet is a subset of some real space okay rm okay that's so all these quantities are nicely defined y minus x squared so this is a oh minimum sorry okay so that is my minimum distance detector okay so i can choose to do such a detector as well if i want to but when will it be optimal <coughs> several things have to be true first of all ml has to be optimal and then you have to have awgn all that okay so all this awgn stuff comes only at the minimum distance level okay so these are general principles and it's important to learn them as general principles and know that you are applying them into a for the specific digital communication problem okay so these are used in so many other areas of communications and signal processing that i don't want you to think that these are digital communication ideas okay these come from a related area they are used in digital communication as well okay and depending on the problem and the joint pdf the minimum distance is not going to be optimal in several cases okay but it's useful to simplify the ml condition to as simple a version as possible okay? so depending on the noise depending on the way noise is added that version might change okay so the, for the awgn case it became the very very simple minimum distance criteria okay so i know it's still abstract but it's important to appreciate this a little bit and the power i mean why were we fundamentally able to do this in digital communication okay the crucial thing was how we transform the waveform channel into the vector channel and how we model the noise how we did this correlation did everything so that we got a vector then we got a joint pdf and then you could just directly apply these detection principles without worrying about anything okay otherwise you have to think so many get confused with so many other details okay so hopefully that the power of this is hopefully clear to you okay so the assumptions and the models are very crucial in this okay any questions comments okay all right so ultimately x hat is a function of y okay so that's another thing i want you to i wrote it down once again but okay so it's a function of y and the receiver is assumed to have different types of knowledge for instance if the receiver has to implement either the map or the ml accurately in the general case what should the receiver know should know the joint pdf right so if you don't know the joint pdf or the conditional pdf you can't do it but look at the minimum distance detector it seems to be more general you don't have to know much you just do you don't have to know anything but you may not know if it's optimal or not unless you know the joint pdf but it's fine i mean you can do it so those kind of things are also valuable in so many ways in practice okay even if you don't know it's optimal or not you should be able to do something you know? so you should have all these detectors at hand okay so some getting something to work is also important all right so the next thing i did uh, pretty quick without going into too many details is this idea of decision regions i think it's very clear i don't have to define these things formally but uh, what i thought i'll quickly just run through it so that i formally define it and then i talk about it okay so so in my signal space so why this y belongs to my uh, signal space right well not really yeah it's in the signal space okay but typically it is not a point on the constellation right uh, on the constellation right okay so is this clear so if you do bpsk for instance your constellation is minus 1 and plus 1 y can be any real number okay theoretically any real number in practice it will be bounded by something but it can be any number but it will be on the space okay it can't be somewhere else that's the thing i want to 
figure out. So one can think of in an actual reception situation, one can think of something called a received constellation. What will be the received constellation? Yeah, all the points y that you received, if you put a dot next to them, you will get a received constellation and you can imagine, you know the PDF for y, so it will be bunched up around the transmit constellation, but it won't be on top of it, it will be around that uh, point somewhere. Okay? So keep that uh, notion in mind. So now I want to split the signal space into different regions so that if I am falling in a particular region, my x hat is going to be a particular transmit point. Okay? So that is the whole notion of decision regions. Okay? So you have for instance BPSK 0, plus 1 and minus 1. Okay? So maybe this is bit 0 and bit 1. Okay? I want to find that subset of the real line. In this case, my signal space is the real line. right? That subset of the signal space, this is the real line, on which my decision will always be 0. Okay? So set of all y in R such that x hat of y equals what? Plus 1. This will be my decision, decision region for, for the constellation point plus 1. What will be the decision region for constellation point minus 1? Same thing such that x hat of y equals minus 1. Okay? So if you do the minimum distance detector for instance, the decision region is very clear and obvious. Okay? So every point on the right half of the real line, okay, positive part of the real line will be the decision region corresponding to this guy. Okay. Okay. So this is this decision region, and the other decision region will be the negative part of the real line. Okay. So I can generalize this definition. If I know in general my signal space is R M, okay, what is my decision region for in general? So this is general. My decision region for some x in my constellation is set of all y in R M, assuming my dimension is M. Okay, so something I've been doing all along. So such that what x hat of y equals well, I should put a bar here as well equals x. Okay, so that's a formal definition, and you can see this will this will be a partition of the signal space. What do I mean by a partition? all these sets will not intersect and together they will encompass the entire space. So that is the partition. Okay? So it will be a partitioning. Okay? One can write down proofs for those things, but I guess it is very, very clear. If you decide on one thing, you do not decide on another thing. Right? It is very clear that it has to partition the signal space. Okay? And this decision region, okay, so maybe I will call it dx. Okay? It is good to write down the probability of error or probability of correct decision in a very succinct form. Okay? Do you see why? Okay, so the decision region for a particular x can be used to write down the probability of error in a very probability of correct decision in a very clear way. So, for instance, what's the probability that x hat equals x given x equals x? What's this probability? Given that you transmitted x small x, what's the probability? Probability that y lies in dx. Okay, so this is a pro this is this is nice to write down. So, this decision, this decision regions are analogously defined. So, you see where the definition comes from. Motivation is to write down probability of correct decision in a very compact way. So, once you identify the region, so you integrate over all y in that region, you get your probability. Okay? So, what is this? This, this can be nicely written as integrate integral over y belonging to dx f y y dy. Okay? So this is the this is the probability of error for a particular x. So if you change x, this probability might change. Maybe it doesn't change. Okay, I don't know. But depending on the decision regions, it will work out in this form. All right. Any questions? Okay. Okay. What will be probability of error given x equals x? One minus this thing. Okay, so it's all our y not belonging to dx u integral. Okay. So it's useful to write it down. That's always good to know. Okay, so let's do uh, let's do more decision regions for a while. Just get used to decision decision regions for minimum distance is very easy to do. Okay, so it's no big deal. You just look at the Euclidean space and the two two dimensions. Quickly mark it out. We'll do that exercise for a while, and then we'll come back and try to see 
how some of these probability of error calculations are done and how it will simplify and what are the real parameters that are of interest to us. Okay, so that's what we'll do next. So I think what what did I do? I did I did a few examples. I want to know what I got to. Did I do BPSK? I think I did BPSK. What else did I do? Just BPSK? Oh. Okay, so the next example uh, I want to look at is uh, 4 PAM. Okay, see so these are examples of decision regions. Okay, so I'm going to say this is the second example because the first is. Yes. Did I make a mistake? What happened? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the integral should be over the conditional PDF. You're right, you're right, you're right, you're right. You're right. In all my eagerness. Just forgot about the conditioning. Okay, so yeah, everything is conditioned, okay? So, of course, everything is conditioned. You're right. Thanks for pointing it out. Okay, everything is conditioned. Okay, so so let's go to the examples of decision regions. I did I did BPSK. Let's do four PAM next. It's it's the next easiest example. Okay, I have zero plus one plus three minus one minus 3 okay so that's my constellation so i'll put my i'll put a x mark around the constellation points okay so it's almost trivial right so what's the decision region for plus 3 starts at 2 and goes off to the right okay so you see that this is the decision region for uh, D3 is going to be 2 infinity. Okay, is that clear? So what would be D1? Yeah, it will be exactly only this, right? This guy is going to be, well, you might argue about the square bracket. And, so what do I mean by the square bracket, by the way? I'm including 2. Okay, so you can argue about this... Uh, square bracket and curve bracket so why is it not relevant why should i not care about whether i put a square bracket here or a curve? yeah exactly so probability that i get y equals 0 is what zero okay so there's no probability since it's a continuous pdf it won't change any of my probability calculation so i can put anything i want it doesn't matter okay so what's d minus 1 okay d minus 1 is going to be this set minus 2 0 and then d minus 3 is going to be this guy which is okay maybe I'll do minus infinity minus 2 okay so it's quite simple so the next uh, example I'm going to see is uh, uh, 4 QAM okay so what's what is the 4 QAM constellation? How many points does it have? 4 points. What are the 4 points? Plus or minus 1, plus or minus 1, right? So those are the 4 points that you have. Okay, so you have 4 points. Okay, this is my 4 QAM. And... Uh, what would be the set of all points which will decode to? Yeah, the four quadrants. Right? So it's really easy to write down. This is going to be D11. This is going to be D minus 11. This is going to be D minus 1 minus 1. This is going to be D1 minus 1. Okay. Okay, the four quadrants are the decision regions for 4QAM. Okay. So if I did uh, 4 QPSK, so for instance, QPSK, the way I defined it, which is a rotated version of this, right? You remember that I did a QPSK where my points were plus or minus 1, plus or minus J. Okay, so I did that also. There, what would happen? You will have to do the X equals Y and X equals minus Y lines and take the different four different paths you get from there for that. Part. So it's 
quite easy to see. Okay, it's possible to geometrically define it. So for the for a for a general case also it's possible to do it, but I'm not going to spend time doing that. We'll just do for specific cases. Okay, the next one I'll do, which is maybe marginally more interesting, is the 8 PSK. Okay. So the 8 PSK constellation. Okay, so it's good to draw a dot at circle. I think this sh this thing should do circles and all that very nicely, but I should figure it out sometime. Anyway, so so 8 PSK has uh, eight points. Okay. So once again, it's, I think reasonably clear. So this angle is what pi by four, right? That angle is pi by 4. So if you want to write down all the points that would be mapped to say plus 1, what would you do? T1. So you do from pi by 8 to minus pi by 8. Okay. So everything that falls within that cone, so to speak, a pi by 4 angle around the x-axis. Okay. So this is this guy is pi by 8. This guy is pi by 8. Okay, so this would be D1. Okay, so if you want to write down uh, for for this guy, you'll have to again draw a line which is pi by 8 from this axis, right? And this region would be D E power J pi by 4. Okay that would be that region. So likewise you can do it. So it's just different type of cones if you will um, angular views that are halfway. Okay. So like I said if, if somebody gives you an arbitrary set of points you should be able to do this. Can you can you imagine a systematic way of going about doing this? What's a systematic way of doing it? What are these lines? These lines that I drew can be described as some things of the points. What are the points? What, what are those? The perpendicular bisectors of lines joining any two points. So you draw a whole bunch of them and then you can from there you can easily figure out the actual regions that are of interest to you. Okay, Some of them will nicely overlap. So given any set of points, arbitrary set of points which has a constellation, you draw perpendicular bisectors right? and they will intersect somewhere, they will not intersect somewhere. They will define pretty much all the regions that are of interest to you as far as decision regions are concerned. Okay? So I am not going to do any such thing. We will just do examples and we will be happy. Okay, so the next example, which is a little bit more interesting, is 16 QAM. Okay, so so far every single decision region that we have looked at looked exactly the same, right? Except for the 4 PAM case where you had two different types of decision regions, right? Everything else seemed to have similar picture, but for 16 QAM, you will see you will in fact get three different types of decision regions. Okay, so you can get different types depending on how the constellation looks and uh, this is an example to illustrate how you can get three different types. Okay, so I have 16 different points, four in each quadrant. Okay, so if I go ahead and draw the perpendicular bisectors, you see all these guys share one all these guys share one, right? And then these guys will share one, and these guys will share one, and the axis axis themselves are perpendicular, the remaining perpendicular bisectors. And that's it. Once I've drawn all the perpendicular bisectors, I should just pick out the regions that are defined by them as decision regions. Okay? So you can make a lot of arguments to make your process easier, but anyway, I think that's clear enough. Okay? So you see essentially there are three types of decision regions. One for the interior points, one for the corner points and one more for the side points that are on the outside. Okay, so you have three different types. They all look different. Okay. Okay, so this part is uh, reasonably clear. So a very typical standard tutorial and exam question is what? You give something that is not quite square, you know, it looks a little bit different. And then test your skill in being able to draw perpendicular bisectors carefully, define decision regions carefully and then do computations with that. Okay, so that's a very standard uh, question. Doesn't test much, but still 
helps me great right so it's very useful all right so let's uh, let's go through and do a probability of error computation now but for that i want to stick to mpam so i'll do uh, i'm going to do for mpam so we we'll, so the final example we'll see will be for mpam okay so we'll do a general mpam it's not really a big deal okay so you see we have 0 plus 1 plus 3 so on till plus m minus 1 then you have minus 1 minus 3 minus m minus 1 right and then you do decision regions you'll have two types of decision regions one for all the interior points which will be what 0 comma 2 2 comma 4 4 comma 6 so on till whatever m minus m minus 4 comma m minus 2 okay and then you have two others for the outermost points which is m minus 2 comma infinity and minus infinity comma minus m minus 2 okay so that's the that's the decision region so if you want to write down very succinctly you can say d m minus 1 is okay maybe i'll do this m minus 2 comma infinity and then d minus m minus 1 is okay so so i'm going to not bother with all these so let me just fix this brackets for a while and then forget about it okay and then di is going to be what i minus 1 to i plus 1 okay so that i can do always this is for uh, other i okay so that's mpam all right so so it's fine we did the decision regions by themselves like i said they don't mean much but they give you a nice handle on quickly computing probability of error or writing down the expression which is the first step in going ahead and computing right so it's, it's useful to compute probability of error and that's where the real attention should be the point is to compute probability of error okay so decision regions are just a tool okay one can say decision regions can also be used in your decoder right so you can then use it in the implementation itself but the main tool is like i said for probability of error okay so, uh, so, 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 let's do probability of error for MPAM. I'm not doing M squared QAM in general because M squared QAM will be a simple generalization of 16 QAM. Okay. So, you just do the perpendicular bisectors and then just look at the squares that it defines. One can write down, in fact, one can write down general expressions like this for M squared QAM also. It's not too difficult. All right. So, the thing I want to really concentrate on at least for the rest of this lecture is probability of error for MPAM MPAM under a minimum distance decoder ok so remember I have to, I have to always specify what decoder I am doing right otherwise it makes no, no sense in do, de defining anything ok so so I am going to look at probability of error for MPAM under a minimum distance decoder okay so you can argue when it will be optimal and all that and that's it's, it's okay for us okay so this is the minimum distance decoder that we're going to use okay so i want to step back a little bit and point point out some of the initial comments i made about the main parameters of interest in a in a digital communication system okay so what are the various parameters power of the signal bandwidth of the signal rate at which you're sending data noise power that you have and then and then probability of error okay so far the first four things we've been doing on and off i've been mentioning okay so we've been trying to model it understand it maybe not all the trade-offs maybe the trade-offs are not clear the thing that brings out all the trade-offs in one go is this probability of error computation okay so the only thing that may not be apparent is bandwidth we'll see soon enough how bandwidth can be brought into the picture okay so it's also brought into the picture here so the, the one quantity which ties everything together is probability of error it should right well, that's the most important thing you don't care about anything else right probability of error has to go to zero or should be small enough okay so and this calculation is what's going to tie everything together okay so i wanted to pay attention to it it's not a very difficult computation but it's a crucial computation because it will tell us the quantity that is of important to us and it will also introduce us to this quantity called signal to noise ratio which becomes so crucial in the entire uh, definition okay so that's what we're going to do it's, it's very simple and you might say i'm doing this computation for m pam over minimum distance seems like an abstract calculation but hopefully you agree that this constellation actually represents 
actual signals right real pass band signals or real base band signals and i know how to go from constellation to the signal okay energy actually is the same thing okay same way noise power is also something which is real which i have modeled okay same thing is true for the decoder also something that i can actually implement so all these things are very real computations don't imagine them to be some abstract probability exercise all right so let's go ahead and do that and uh, one argument i made for when i did this pam was that this root es or some factor multiplying the minus 1 and plus 1 doesn't matter okay but i want to show that it doesn't matter with probability of error so uh, so that's what i'm going to do in the in the definition okay so i'm going to change my pam to a general pam where i introduce an arbitrary distance between minus 1 and plus 1 so i'm going to say my distance between minus 1 and plus 1 is d okay so if my distance between minus 1 and plus 1 has to be d what should i say this is minus d by 2 to d by 2 okay so my next point would be 3 times d by 2 point on this side would be minus 3 times d by 2 so on till m minus 1 times d by 2 so on till minus m minus 1 times d by 2 okay so you'll see eventually so what really matters is the ratio of d or d square to the power of the noise variance so the ratio only matters so i can fix d to be arbitrary and vary the whole thing by varying the denominator alone so that's why in that sense it doesn't matter okay so so that's why we did that but to bring out the point we'll introduce this uh, introduce this d and this d is called the minimum distance separating any two constellation point right so this is the minimum distance in this okay so that's a useful thing okay so my transmitted uh, signal constellation point is uniform in in this alphabet that's my alphabet is there a question do you have a question to ask or okay okay so this is uh, x and uh, what about my noise noise evolved okay so before we proceed we should compute first energy in the signal okay i'll denote this e sub s this is what expected value of x squared okay so if you do that computation it will work out to m squared minus 1 d squared by 12 okay so that's the computation that it will work out okay so you can play it around and then write down d as what or you can do the reverse d is square root of 12 es by m squared minus 1 okay so these are the computations that you can play around okay my noise n is normal with mean 0 and variance and not by 2 okay so if i want to think of energy in my noise right uh, see remember this was this was what this was energy of expected value of x of t squared right so that's how i got to this expected value of x squared okay so likewise here energy in noise has to be expected value of n squared of t okay so if you go back and look at the way i did the derivation i will only use n1 of t which is the projection of n of t on my signal space and i'll only worry about the expected value of that and this we showed was equal to n0 by 2 is that right wrong maybe yeah i think so okay n0 by 2 well, will this this will work out to n0 by 2 okay we'll take it to be n0 by 2 all right okay so so anyway so even if so there might be a constant missing here but what happened something very bad happened here. okay so so this will this will take to be n0 by 2 so you can check this you can check the relationship between this guy and this guy and make sure that it works out okay so this will work out to n0 by 2 okay so 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 okay so anyway so even if this is not important to us we'll take z n to be n0 by 2 okay so the next thing is uh, the received received value y which is x plus n there's something that's disturbing me about the way i wrote this down okay so maybe i'll fix this later but i'll think about this and fix it later anyway so y is x, uh, x plus n this is my received value okay 
so so what's next uh, yeah that's what was disturbing me a little bit too but anyway it doesn't matter yeah let's okay so let's not worry about this guy now man. don't don't worry about this guy i'll fix this later but i'll define some en to be n not by 2 okay so it turns out d squared by n not is is the important parameter okay so so it has to be n not so just wrote it down without thinking too much forget about this n not by 2 is important so i'll define en to be n not by 2 just take that as a definition okay so the received value y is x plus n and what am i doing for the detector Okay, my detector is my minimum distance decoder. Okay, so I have to compute now probability of error, which I will define as P E, which I'll write down as P E, which will denote as P E. This is probability that x hat not equal to x. So remember, how did I define x hat? X hat is the minimum distance uh, decoder. Okay, so we know all about this. All right, so let's go ahead and do this computation. So I'm going to say, I'm going to condition on x first. Okay, probability that x hat not equal to x. Is there a question? What happened? Okay, x hat. So I don't have to write down vectors. It's all just one number. I'll just write down in general, just so that we get a feel. Given that x equals x times probability that x equals x okay so this i can do okay so this this quantity now is not too bad to compute okay so now i'm back to the decision region okay so that's the decision region so i have to compute this what about this guy what will i do to this i'm going to assume uniform i said that uniform so this will be 1 by m okay so that's fine all right so that's that's how i'm breaking down my probability of error okay so go back and look at the way i did it did for deriving the optimal detector for deriving the optimal detector what did i do to probability of error or probability of correct decision i did something which was different from this yeah so you conditioned on y okay so it's a slightly different way of looking at probability of error okay so once you do the optimal detector and fix your detector this is a much easier way of computing probability of error okay so when you want to derive the detector you have to condition on y it seems like a strange uh, tool but it's it's useful okay so that's probability of error and now this each of these case can be easily computed so how do i compute probability of x hat not equal to x given x equals x okay so how do i compute this there are two cases first case i'll consider is x is plus or minus m minus 1 d by 2 okay in this case what will be the probability what will this be okay integrate from minus what okay yeah so you have to in integrate from so for instance let me fix x to be plus m minus 1 d by 2 okay so somehow suppose i fix this to be m minus 1 d by 2 okay so what should i do here minus infinity to m minus 2 to times d by 2 okay there's always a times d by 2 floating around integrate what I'm sorry? Minus. No, I'm taking x to be plus m minus 1 d by 2. Is that fine? I'm looking at the rightmost point. Okay, so I have to integrate this out. What? What is my fy? Okay, give me some numbers. <laughs> the limit's correct or not? It's correct? Okay, so what should I put inside? The normal PDF, right? So it will be some normal PDF. What will be the mean? And I'll write down simply normal PDF. What will be the mean? M minus 1 d by 2. And the variance will be N naught by 2. Okay, so that will be the integral. Okay, so you have to put the D whatever. I didn't write it carefully. So this is the this is the integral okay so what about the minus case x equals minus m minus 1 d by 2 
the same thing will be equal to integral from minus m minus 2 d by 2 to infinity normal with mean minus m minus 1 d by 2 and not by 2 okay so i want you to write give me these two expressions in terms of q functions what is q q is qx is what qtl right so, just so that i don't it's too many x's floating around qt is what 1 by root 2 pi integral t to infinity e power minus t square by 2 dt so this is q i want you to give me these two expressions simplify them and give me an expression in terms of q i'm going to claim these two are the same do you do you believe me uh, they have to be equal so what will what will it be in terms of q q so the claim is what he's saying is this is equal to q i'm sorry minus d by okay just give me q of positive numbers one don't give me minus he gets scared if we say q of minus okay okay so let me write this down completely this probability that x hat not equal to x given x equals x okay why do i get confused why do i get scared if you say q of minus something q of minus anything will be greater than 0.5 and all that so it's not a very nice thing to have Q of okay so you should get something like this d by 2 by root n naught by 2 okay how many of you think you can get to this expression okay so it's very simple not very difficult but you have to be able to get to that get to that expression okay so this guy is probably a much sim easier guy to work with than the other one the other one you have to do a little bit of a twist turning around to understand okay so this is how it works okay so it's q of d by 2 divided by root of n naught by 2 okay so that's this probability what 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 about interior points two times that do you believe me okay so for interior points x equals plus or minus i d by 2 i equals what uh, 1 3 so on till m minus 3 probability that x hat not equal to x given x equals x is 2 times q of d by 2 divided by root n naught by 2 ok so we will stop here I think I am running out of time so we will pick up from here on Monday and try to finish up